Thank you. Great, so I'll start. Uh, so thank you guys for inviting me to give a talk today. Um, so I'm gonna, a bit of background about me. I did a, my PhD in, on genetic factors associated with uh, complications of pregnancy, in particular, recurrent miscarriage and intrauterine growth restriction. And I did, it was a joint PhD between Imperial and UCL. So my supervisors were Dane Leslie Regan, who is a, a gynecologist from Imperial and Professor Ngutrumur, who is a professor of genetics uh, at UCL. So I decided to um, present a, a study um, that I did in my PhD that is uh, mostly in genetics, about, it's about genetics since it's a genetic society. So I'm just gonna give you a bit of background on miscarriage and then I'm gonna take you step by step on this study to show you how we work in the lab and uh, you know all the steps we do to lead to hopefully a publication. So this was a study published in 2019. So uh, miscarriage is the commonest complication of pregnancy and it is a spontaneous loss of a fetus before it has reached viability. So that's so that is between the time of conception and, and that uh, 24 week of uh, pregnancy. Anything that um, um, any loss of fetus during that period is, is is a miscarriage. And there are two types of miscarriages. We have sporadic ones and uh, recurrent ones. So the sporadic ones are experienced by at least one quarter of all women, and the risk of the miscarriages increases with age. And the most important cause of a sporadic miscarriage um, is fetal and aploidy. So this is if you have abnormal number, if the fetus has abnormal number of chromosomes. So instead of having 46, we have 45 or 47. And uh, the current miscarriage is defined as three or more consecutive pregnancy losses. And it affects about one to 3% of couples trying to conceive, which is about 6,000 couples in the UK every year. And it is uh, associated with uh, other pregnancy complications, including intrauterine growth restriction, uh, prematurity, and preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure. And there is a lot of factors that um, have been attributed to recurrent miscarriage, and some of them are genetic factors, as I said, aneuploidy or chromosomal cell locations, uh, anatomical disorders, and endocrine defects. Uh, for example, antiphospholipid syndrome, which is the it's an autoimmune disease um, caused by the presence of uh, circulating maternal antibodies or thrombophilic disorders. So uh, people, patients with thrombophilic disorders have a tendency to thrombosis. So uh, there is uh, blood clotting in the placental uh, vessels that can lead to fetal loss. And for example, in the uh, thrombophilic disorders, there are, uh, they have, there are genes that, uh, like the prothrombin gene or factor V lipin, that uh, mutations in these genes are associated with, um, with miscarriages because they increase the risk of thrombosis. However, in the ma majority of patients, the cause of recurrent miscarriage remains unexplained, which is very devastating for the, uh, from the, for the patients. So the aim of one of my projects was to identify new candidate genes for recurrent miscarriage. And um, I was working with the recurrent miscarriage clinic at St. Mary's Hospital in, in London, which basically whenever a couple has more than three consecutive miscarriage, the GP will refer them to this clinic. And uh, the clinic there will give them um, uh, guidance, advice, a treatment, if they know the, the, fact, the factors for the miscarriage. And if they agree, if these people agree to participate also in research, we used to collect their uh, blood for, from both the female patient and her husband uh, to have them in our bank for future research. So over the years, the, there are about 8,000 samples collected, 8,000 pairs collected in this bank. And there are detailed records of the samples, so the maternal age, ethnicity, uh, the known factors for the miscarriages and the week of miscarriage. So uh, if, if anything happens, if a miscarriage happens be before the 12th week is considered an early miscarriage, uh, so it happens in the first trimester, anything that happens after the 12th week is considered a late miscarriage, and everything that happens after the 24th week is considered a stillbirth. So most of the miscarriage that occur are early miscarriages. 
So we, I, I looked into these uh, samples that we had to find any interesting families and, um, and, uh, and ones that didn't have a known risk factor associated with them. And we, I found this family here where you can see the patient here had a total of 29 early miscarriages. So she had 17 miscarriages with her first husband, uh, five miscarriages with her second husband, and seven miscarriages with her third husband. So this is a family from Bangladesh. They live in London. And we had blood uh, in the bank from the patient and, uh, and her third husband. And we also had tissue from a, what we call a product conception. So this is, um, uh, so pregnancy or cure, but then the, the woman miscarried. So sometimes if they come into the clinic, if they can do a, like a, a mini surgery to remove excess tissue from the uterus. So when you collect this product, it's a product conception. So we had tissue from that and blood from the uh, patient and the husband, and then the two brothers, her two brothers uh, uh, agreed to participate in research. You can see here, her parents have uh, three, um, uh, three children, and but the mother also had three miscarriages, but in her case, it were late miscarriages associated with her late uh, age. And um, so we decided to do whole exome sequencing in this family, in the patient, the, the husband, the brothers, and the tissue sample. So this was performed in collaboration with Ghost Gene at UCL. Uh, I, I mean, I hope you know what a whole exome sequencing is. It's, it's next generation sequencing where the whole exome can be sequenced in one go. So, so the coding is basically the, so the coding uh, parts of the genome are sequenced. And here is, I just saw an, an example of um, uh, read alignment. So let's say this is a gene, the, the boxes here are the exons, and then there are probes to amplify the different exons. And then there are different um, depths, how many times the, the exon has been sequenced. So the more read depth we have, the better the, uh, we are more confident for the result. And then these uh, read alignments are then um, aligned to the reference genome, and then we can see what differences there are in the, in the exomes we are sequencing uh, to the reference genome. And obviously, we, you know that we have lots of uh, variation, you know, variations in our genome, so we have lots of SNPs, thousands of SNPs, single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphins in our genome. So you have to have a way of uh, prioritizing all these variations seen in the genome. So I used uh, this program called Ingenuity, and it's a very um, user-friendly user -friendly software that can um, filter out the variants and prioritize genes, genes of interest. I'm just going to go, go through the different filters that I did. So um, at this point, I should tell you that when we got back the results, the product of conception uh, was exactly the same sequence as the mother, which meant that it was in fact a maternal decidua. So decidua is the is a maternal part of the placenta. So usually when you try to collect this product conception, like 80% of the times, uh, the nurses collect uh, placenta that is maternal instead of fetal, because it's, it's, it's the fetus is so tiny, uh, they, yeah, they, they usually collect maternal decidua. So at this point, we only had the, the mother, the, sorry, the patient, uh, her husband, and the two brothers. So when we did exome sequencing, you can see that we're about 122,000 um, variants in 17,000 genes. So the first filter is basically a confidence filter. So it removes all the, all the variants that are, the read depth wasn't good enough. So we are not confident that they are good, um, the, the sequence is, is Read, um, sequence nicely. So these are removed from the uh, from the analysis. So we are left with 115,000 variants. Then we exclude all the common variants uh, from this analysis. So there are different databases, such as DBSNP, for example, that uh, they have sequenced lots of uh, thousands of people of different ethnicities, and they have identified more or less all the uh, single nuclear polymorphins in our genome. So we excluded all the, all the known variants because we don't expect the, the variant causing this phenotype to be a common one. 
Then we included from all these 17,000 variants, we included only the ones that are predicted to be deleterious. So there are different softwares such as SIRT, Polyphen, that they use uh, different algorithms to predict pathogen pathogenicity of the variant. So this, so depending on the on the change on the on the nucleotide change and the amino acid change. So in this one, we, we included only the variants that are predicted to be deleterious. And then the genetic analysis depends on the on your pedigree. So, for example, in this case, we assume that the variant would be um, the mode of inheritance would be a, a dominant mode of inheritance. So we are expecting uh, the the mutation the variant to be present in the patient, but not present in the brothers or the husband. And also at the same at the same time, we had because it was a, a family from Bangladesh. We also had four other Asian females that we are used as control samples. So they were females that had at least one successful pregnancy. So they were compared to this patient as well. And we ended up with 37 variants and 34 genes. And the last filter is basically the biological context filter, which uh, looks into the into PubMed and links if, if any of these 34 genes were linked to your phenotype. So in our case, miscarriages or thrombosis. It came down to one, uh, one variant in one gene. And this was uh, this gene here, FKB4. You can see the, the change lalin to gl uh, glutamic acid. And you can see it's present in the case in the patient, but not in the controls. And it says it's a missense change. It's predicted to be damaging. So at this point, I mean, this is a bit biased because we are we the software linked this gene to a, um, a mouse phenotype where, where knockout mice are infertile. So at this point, we cannot exclude any of the we couldn't exclude any of these 34 genes just because they weren't linked in your disease before. So we had a look at this at the at the table of these 34 genes, and we identified three more genes that we found interesting uh, that could be causing this phenotype. So the first thing, the first thing we do when we have uh, sequencing uh, sequencing data from exome um, exome sequencing, we always have to confirm this with by doing uh, the partitional Zucker sequencing, because sometimes what we get back from the next generation sequencing could be could be artifacts, especially in regions that are a bit repetitive, uh, like we have GCC GCC let's say repeats when they the, when they try to align the genome, maybe it's not aligned correctly, and then we end up with some artifacts. So we always have to confirm with Zanger sequencing, and that's what we did in the, in these four genes. So you can see here in the first gene. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with chromatograms, but when it's a, a single peak, it means that it's chromozygote. So both alleles have the same. Uh, uh, have the same nucleotide, so it's a C. So it's a, uh, the husband and the brothers are homozygous C. Whereas a patient, you can see that there's a C trait change. There's a C allele and an A allele at the position. Uh, so this gene is also known as FKB52 because it's 52 kilodaltons the protein. And it's a member of the immunophilin protein family that play a role in immune regulation and processes involved in protein folding and trafficking. And the protein binds to the progesterone receptor to optimize progesterone signaling. And as I mentioned, the female knockout mice are infertile. The second gene was serpin B2. Again, you can see husband and brothers are wild, wild type at this position here, whereas the patient has a missing chain, a C2 gene. Uh, this is not so known as placenta plasminogen inhibitor 2. And this gene has been linked to pregnancy in some studies, but its role was not fully uh, characterized. Uh, the other gene we were interested in, it was uh, complement regulatory protein 46. And here you can see there is a, a 16 base pair deletion in the three prime UTR. So this is how, so basically one allele is wild type like the above and the other allele has a deletion. So this is how deletions look on, uh, on Zanker sequencing. And um, and alterations in the complement regulation um, have been associated with pregnancy complications, including pregnancy losses. And uh, polymorphies in this gene were associated with recurrent miscarriages in some studies, but not in others. And uh, the last thing we are interested in was microRNA uh, 7D. And uh, you can see the husband and the two brothers were um, wild type, whereas the patient has an AC insertion. If you look closely on these 
on this chromatogram, you can see that the, at this position here, the SET is a, a blue and a red uh, peak. You can see the blue and the red peak here, but the constant see a green and a blue peak here. So it means that there is an AC inserted here, these two peaks, the green and the blue. So uh, microRNA 7D is highly expressed in human endometrium, and it has been shown to be upregulated along with other microRNAs in mouse uterus and implantation sites. So, so as you can see, we have confirmed these four variants in the in the family, but in the patient. But of, of course, you cannot build. It's very hard to build a case with having one patient. Like, um, so we decided to sequence these variants in more fun, in more in a bigger cohort. So we had. 120 white European patients, recurring miscarriage patients, and 100 Asian patients. And the Asian patients were like from Bangladesh, Pakistan, India. And we also had 100 Bangladeshi controls. So these were um, females that had at least one sexual preference. So we didn't, so we are, we didn't expect to find any of these variants in the controls. So when we sequenced this cohort, we could see that we, we couldn't identify any of these variants, any of these variants in either the controls or the recurrent miscarriage patients. Uh, at the same time, we managed to get uh, buccal swaps from the grandparents. So we extracted DNA and we wanted to check if these mutations were de novo. As you can see, the grandmother was wild type for all the mutations, whereas uh, where the grandfather carried all these carried all the variants. So all these variants were inherited from the grandfather. And, and at this point, we couldn't exclude any of these genes because uh, it just because it was in the grandfather, because it would mean that this is a gene that doesn't manifest itself in males, since it is a, a, a recurrent miscarriage um, candidate gene. So uh, we decided. So we decided to, since we couldn't find this variant in other patients, we decided to sequence the whole gene now of the of the whole genes, and uh, we decided to take forward FKBB4 and SNBB2 because they were more straightforward as they had missed mutations. So it's more it's more easy to interpret a missed mutations because they change amino acids, whereas. CD46 has this deletion in the three prime UTR, which doesn't, it's an untranslated bridge, so it wouldn't lead to uh, amino acid changes. And at that point, a little, uh, we didn't know much about microRNAs. We now know that they uh, regulate other genes, but at that point, we didn't know, it was harder to interpret uh, the microRNA results. So we, we focus on these two genes here with the missing mutation. We decided to sequence the whole gene in the cohorts and in the controls. And, uh, and to sequence it, basically just sequence the other primers, you sequence all the different exons in, the, in those genes, and you optimize the primers according to temperature and uh, so on. So when we, when we sequence the whole of serpent 2, you can see, the, I mean, the, the one in yellow is the change that was found in the patient. But you can see that this gene is quite has a lot of SNPs. Um, so all these RS number are SNPs that are already recorded in DB SNP in databases, and you can see that it's quite common. So like 31 heterozygotes, eight homozygotes, 35 heterozygotes, 15 homozygotes. So it's very common SNP. We can only find one a novel change in one head in one patient, but this was a synonymous change. So it didn't lead to a uh, a minor acid change. So we couldn't find anything interesting in when we sequenced this gene. When we, however, when we sequenced FKB before, uh, we could see that we could, uh, we had found three novel changes, misses changes in two Asian patients that weren't found in the controls. And also we found a very rare uh, change, um, SNP, SNP in another patient. So we decided, we, we decided to include this as well because for example, in DB SNP, uh, it was found in one patient in DB SNP, and we don't know if that patient was a male or a female, and we didn't know if uh, that, if that person, sorry, had uh, any miscarriages. So we here is just to show the three extra um, uh, variants we identified in the three other patients. So all of them were missing changes. We had a, four, a total of four changes in this gene, <coughs> and. Uh, I mean, usually the next thing to do is to um, predict pathogenicity. So we this is a list of different softwares 
that we can use. And all of them, as I said, use different algorithms. And as you can see, uh, all of the um, changes were predicted to be damaging or disease causing by one or more uh, softwares. And also we, we check the conservation, amino acid conservation in um, a list of mammals. And you can see that the amino acids are conserved. So if it's an A to E change, uh, alanine to glutamic acid and the alanine is conserved throughout the species, it means that it is in, it's important it's, um, at, this, at that position. So obviously, now that now that we found four, now that we found four, uh, four um, uh, variants in this gene, obviously it's not enough for a publication. You always have to do functional studies, so you have to prove uh, some kind of um, causality, like some kind of uh, altering of the function of the protein. So, um, so this is showing the the FKP. 52 protein, and you can see that these two, the first two uh, variants are, uh, are found in domain one, and the other two are found in domain three of the protein. And for example, here, this domain has a PPAs activity, which we will come back to it a bit later. So one of, once, one of the functional sites that we can do is in silico studies. So this was done in collaboration with Professor Maya Top from Elizabeth University. Um, so this is when we start collaborating with other people because, for example, in our lab, we wouldn't know where to start within silico studies. We are purely mostly in genetics lab. So, uh, so uh, Maya, Maya's team um, um, did crystal structures of this protein, and basically with these structures, you can see how the different variants interact in the in this protein. So, for example, here. Uh, if you can see this N125, it was one of the positions, one of the positions that the mutation was found. So we, um, so you can see that it has a hydrogen bond with an with serine at position 115. So it means that if the if there is an amino acid change in this position here, the hydrogen bond wouldn't will stop to exist there, and then the, this keeps the conformation of the pro, the conformation of the protein of the protein in a specific. Um, Place. So if there's the hydrogen bond is not there anymore, the, the shape can change. Also, the other two mutations here, you can see uh, these two mutations here are facing the outwards, um, the outer space of uh, from the protein. And from uh, studies, you can see that they inter so the pink and the dark blue here are two different proteins that interact with our protein. So these uh, these these um, amino acids here are responsible for interaction with other proteins. So again, if there is a change in that, it can mean that interaction will stop to uh, exist. So this one kind of checking functionality uh, functionality of the of the protein. Uh, so I wanted to do some more uh, wet lab work uh, to check for um, uh, to do some more functional studies. So I um, I found the uh, this plasmid here from uh, so I, I googled uh, so I, I did PubMed search to see who else was working on this on this gene and I found uh, a lab in Germany that was working on FKB before but on a completely different disease that they had a plasmid uh, that I was attached to a flag and the flag is a pad so I asked them to ship me some of that plasmid so I could um, I could I wanted to introduce them the different mutations and some polymorphisms in that uh, plasmid. So I'm just gonna guide you through how we did this work in the lab. And so, uh, so this is a plasmid I received from Germany. And uh, so example, PCDNA3 is the plasmid. FKBB4 is the insert here, so gen the gene of interest and the flag is the, the tag that it has. And this plasmid had antibiotic resistant genes, so um, um, it was ampicillin resistant. So first thing to, we do is to do bacteria transformation. So you want to transform this plasmid into bacteria. And to do that, you just heat shock the bacteria. So from uh, ice cold, you put them into water bath, and this, this, this change in temperature shocks the bacteria, and they can take in the plasmid. And then these are plated into an agarose uh, dish. And the next day, uh, the, the bacteria that have uh, taken in the plasmid that has, that has the antibiotic resistance will be the ones that have grown on the petiges. So we pick up some colonies, grew the um, colonies a bit further, and then we extracted uh, DNA using this kit here called MiniPrep. 
and then I sequence the plasmid. And it is always, it's, it's quite important to uh, like check what you have received from, from other labs. It's not, it's not like they would send you something wrong on purpose. It's just because people are working with so many different stuff. We had in the past that we are shipped um, genes that were a bit like truncated versions of that of the, of that protein or they had mutation. So it's always important like to make sure before you start any main experiment to make sure that what you are working with is, is what you wanted. So I sequence the plasma to make sure I have the correct wild type gene. And then I carried out uh, mutagenesis. So basically uh, in mutagenesis, you you use a special kit where you insert a different set of primers and that force the the plasmid when it's synthesized to include a mismatch in the in the in the um, in, in its DNA. So by using different seven different sets of primers, I could introduce the seven different mutations I wanted, the four mutations and three polymorphies I wanted to use as controls. So, and when I did that, I repeated all the steps again to make sure that what I have in my, what I have, it was the mutated uh, gene now. So once I had the wild type plasmid and the mutated uh, plasmids, I did some cell culture. So we culture 293 T cells, which are human embryonic uh, kidney cells, and we did transfection. So we, uh, yeah, we grow the cells in petri dishes, then we transfect them with the different plasmids. And then we we leave them in the, uh, like in in the media to grow until uh, to extract whatever we need. For example, I wanted to extract protein to do Western plots. And and you can see here. Anyway, you can see here that uh, this is a Western plot. It's showing the different uh, plasmids. Uh, as I said, this is a fifty-two kilo tato, so it's a correct size. And um, so it's just to show that you have prote this protein in your cells and it actually is used as a control. So as I mentioned before, one of the, one of the domains of the protein uh, is, has a PPAs activity. So one other, one other functional study we could do is um, check the activity of PPAs. So PPAs are enzymes that catalyze the isomeration of proline and act as a regulatory switch during faulting, activation, and degradation of many proteins. So this was done in collaboration with a company that did this did these assays, these PPAs assays uh, routinely. So I've sent them a plasmids of my, the wild type plasmids and um, the four mutations, the plasmids with the four mutations, also and some other controls. And they did this assay and you can see that uh, there was a significant decrease. There was a significant decrease between um, uh, the wild type and the, and the mutant plasmids, suggesting that these mutations um, uh, alter the, the function of the protein. And uh, yes, and I mean, that's how we, uh, uh, you know, so after, after following this, um, doing some functional studies, we, we managed to uh, publish this uh, uh, two years ago. So just to summarize, I hopefully I have shown you how we step-by-step uh, -step do a, a genetics uh, um, project in the lab. So starting from the family pedigree, to cutting out exome sequencing, uh, prioritizing the variants um, using different softwares like Agility, confirming the variants uh, with Zanker sequencing, uh, screening bigger cohorts because it's always good to have more than one patient, and then cutting out functional studies that can lead to a, a publication. So, I would like to thank everyone that helped me in the lab, uh, all the people at the UCL Institute of Child Health uh, that we work together, and also my funders, which uh, my funding my PhD was was uh, Save the Baby Units. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, you very have any much. Questions? Uh, we have a question in the chat. Yeah, thank there you. is one in the chat. Can I see you? Yeah, so basically different softwares test different, have different algorithms. So some of them will see the, will, um, uh, will see the amino acid change. So they will see, is it a, is like a, a polar, uh, like a, um, uh, maybe like a, 
the, the polar change of the amino acid or the shape of the amino acid, some of them will base more on the conservation list. So they, so all of them are like have different algorithms. That's why they give different, uh, give different results. What are the plan? Can you increase the risk of some of rupture? Uh, I'm afraid I'm, I don't know the genetic factors that for the risk of placental abruption. What do you mean the exam? What do you mean the exam? You mean the patient? Ah, the exome. You mean the exome? I know we're looking for the but could there be any no Ah, okay. So it's, it's asking why we are only increasing the exome. And so basically, back when we did this uh, study, it was uh, it was it was it was only possible to do whole exome sequencing. Whole genome sequencing came a bit later, so we didn't. Yeah, we only did the whole exome back then. Yeah, exome. Yeah. And actually, back then, when we started, I mean, we had obviously this, this was um, this was only one uh, pedigree that we did, and we only so back then it was a bit more expensive to do exome sequencing. Now it's more is is much cheaper. So, but we had only uh, five samples to sequence. So it was a patient, the brother. The two brothers, the husband, and the POC it was only five samples. I mean, we could do other studies as well. For example, we could sequence. Now, now, if we were to do more studies now, we'll, for example, that it's cheaper, we could sequence, for example, uh, f uh, take the patients with, let's say, six or seven miscarriages and sequence 50 patients and see if they have any more any common any common um, uh, variants between patients. But uh, back then, it was much much more expensive to do exome, and yeah, genome wasn't available. Well, you can also unmute yourselves if you don't like to type. Oh, back then it took uh, it. Now it's much it's much quicker. Back it took like four or five months to carry out exome sequence. Yeah. How long did it take you to do the whole study from the time when? Oh, it, so basically, time. when I finished when I finished my PhD, I finished where I because it was this was like the, the fourth project. So I had four main projects in my PhD. So I finished where I identified the four different um, the four different variants, and that's when I finished my PhD. And then because I continue like in a, a postdoc in the lab on a completely different disease, uh, but I was in the same lab, so I managed to continue with the functional studies. Uh, so th th that's the thing with the P I mean, it maybe took me like a year up to to identify the variant, uh, to identify the the variants. But then it took me uh, another year to do all these um, mutagenesis and the functional studies and so on. Yeah, so it takes it can take some time. And I was lucky that I stayed in the same lab to, for a postdoc, so I could finish this work. It would have been a shame. Uh, not to finish it. Uh, yes, time time wise and money wise. Uh, so, by the way, I don't know if I should be read, uh, reading the question. So it says, if you were to do the same experiment now with new technologies available, would it make a big difference, time wise, money wise? So it would definitely be cheaper and faster. But. Uh, uh, the, the things that all this, the ingenuity programs and all the different uh, filtering that they do, it's more or less it's still the same. Um, so I don't think it will make much more difference now. Uh, probably maybe we'll, maybe if more if more articles where we are uh, we are identified with uh, linking other genes with the miscarriages, maybe we'll have maybe more candidates and may, that will make it a bit longer. But uh, but uh, yeah, now Exxon and um, Exxon and uh, it's much cheaper and much faster. And I know that now they do um, genome, ex uh, whole genome, but the thing is that with the whole genome is um, it's so much data that, I mean, imagine if I get 120,000 variants from the exons, imagine the are much bigger. Imagine how many 
uh, variants you will get by sequencing the whole genome and will make it more, it will be even more complicated to um, mm. analyze those uh, results because the introns have different regulatory elements now and they have different other elements. So it will be harder to, uh, you know, predict the function of those elements. So yeah, it, I think people are wor now working with whole, uh, whole genomes uh, take much more time to to prioritize gene and analyze their data. What are you working uh, also, on? Oh, sorry. No, no, nice to ask. Okay, uh, so it's also a follow-up question on practicality. So basically, uh, is it a huge constraint uh, finding the participants, finding people who are willing to uh, submit genetic material? So, so in this case, for example, the patient, I uh, was a 40, I uh, was 46 years old. She had 29 miscarriages. So she was, she was very willing to take part in the study. And you can see from the 8,000 samples, it's, we, we do get enough samples, but for example, in the parents. So we, we also wanted the, grand, the grandparents and the grandparents didn't want to participate in research. So we initially wanted to include them in back some um, um, mm -hmm. data. So, they just didn't want to participate and, uh, and they didn't want to give blood. So by the, I think maybe eighth month of that project, we managed to, uh, to convince them to give us a buccal swab. Which, and we just had a bit of DNA to do some confirmation with Sanger. But yeah, I think if, more or less with my experience, I mean, people are, we, I mean, people are willing to, especially if they are like, they don't know what's causing these miscarriages. I mean, they're more, you know, willing to take part in research. And when you were increasing the cohort, like when you were testing uh, 120 families of different uh, background, was it hard to uh, obtain the data to find the participants for this? No, it was, it was from these 8,000 samples. So the 8,000 samples that we had oh, in the... Okay. So because uh, these people, uh, so it was with Carmen's college patients. So uh, these 8,000 people oh, that, yeah. that had three or more, had three or more miscarriages. So they were all, um, they were all part of this uh, clinic. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, I should mm -hmm. have, I probably missed that. Oh, there is another question on the chat from Joshua. Do you know of any polyps on the hand of the patients who can the therapeutic information? The thing, uh, so for example, for a, for FKBB4, no, because uh, I mean, it's, it's not like, um, because it only it, it's uh, it's only four people out of a hundred, and as you can see, it's it's um, uh, how do you say it's like uh, ethnicity specific. So, so it was only found in Asian population, not in any white European. So the the sample size is a bit smaller. But there are um, uh, studies that in, gen in general uh, do like. Um, uh, therapeutic interventions, for example, like most of the studies that do, but uh, most of the non-risk factor with uh, thrombosis, that they are thrombophilic disorders, they, they have done lots of studies now that they give them daily uh, aspirin treatments, and this helps to uh, remove the clots from the, um, from the, from the patient. So, the, but, but yeah, so, so that's the thing. So with these studies, we need to have also a large number or a large number of patients. So something that is more common, like the factor five Leiden of the prothrombin gene, it's much more easier to do, to do intervention studies. Yeah, it's all about, uh, it's all about numbers. We need lots of, to, Um, the risk of pregnancy, not really. I mean, the only test that they, they only, not, it's not genetic. I mean, it's only if you had, if you had a miscarriage in the past, they just, they, they, for the following up, they just, they just check you like, it's not like everyone in the population will get a screen about genetic factors. It's like only if you had a miscarriage in the past. And also, like, if you are a, of, of an increased age, that will uh, test you for the different, like, 
trisomies or Does anyone else have any questions? No, I guess that's all the questions for today. <laughs> okay, l let me uh, thank Dr. Sherlambos for being with us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, how, oh, how do you say it? It's Lambos. Lambos. Okay, thank you so much for being with us today and giving uh, the talk on such a topic. It's, it was really interesting and I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. So yeah, I just wanted to give you like just what we normally do in the lab but because I think if you don't, if you are not in a actual lab, uh, if you haven't been in a lab before, you maybe it's hard to understand how things are done in the lab. So yes, it was... It was very useful in this aspect because uh, previously I didn't have much of understanding of how, like, the pipeline of the experiment, how does it flows and goes. So thank you so much for this. Well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> um,